This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Summer is the time for blockbuster movies. But what has this summer been like for films? And with so much summer left, what films should be high on your list? We hear about that from two movie critics later in the program. But first, our annual visit about summertime reads with Park Road Books' Sally Brewster. She's not only the owner of one of Charlotte's most popular bookstores, she reads most of the books in the store. So she... (laughs) <laughs> she has her finger on what books are page turners, which books are funny or dry or fascinating. In short, she isn't shy about sharing her opinions on what books are worthwhile for filling up these long, hot days of summer. So welcome back. Good to see you again. Thank you so much, Mike. Nice Glad to have to be you. Here. Uh, if you have uh, questions or comments, you can join us at uh, Charlotte Talks at WFAE.org. Search for WFAE on Facebook. Get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks. And I believe we're on Facebook Live this morning. So... Read any good books lately? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, How is the book business in 2019? Uh, The book business is all over the place. Uh, Normally, we rely on, the book industry relies on a lot of time slots on morning TV. Uh And due to somebody who's unpredictable, (laughs) a lot of our time slots get taken away. So we're all over the place. And then we have tariffs on paper. We're a wood coming out of Canada, which is paper. And so we're dealing with a lot of stuff right now. Um, So uh, aside from people rushing in to buy copies of the Mueller report, (laughs) what titles seem to be a hit? Have have you sold any Mueller reports? We have sold a tremendous amount of Mueller reports, I'm (laughs) thrilled to say. Did they read them? I cannot tell you that. We should do a survey. Maybe we'll do that on uh, Facebook or something this morning, do a survey. Have you bought it and have you read it? Aside from that, is there a hot title that that is just flying off the shelf? Um, There's various ones. There's just not one. Um, You know, I was thinking when my movie counterparts were here, at least I have a choice of many thousands of books to choose from. Um, They have smaller ones. But there's something for everybody out there this summer. Now, I, we're going to talk about nine titles. Well, how did you settle on the nine titles that you decided to talk well, to I, us about? Well, I could have done less. I could have done more. No, no, I mean, I can that. always... Um, they're you... the ones that speak to me at the moment. I mean, it, my list changes weekly. Oh. Um, with new books coming out, books I've read, hype, buzz. Um, you know, when I talk about books, it's always changing. And are there trends over the year? In other words, are people coming in in the summertime? Do they come in and buy different kinds of books than they buy if they come in in September or December? Um, it's a little bit more, are you going on vacation? Do you not want to think? It, 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 people get more tailored in the summertime. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be on an airplane for 10 hours. Give me something that so the guy next to me is not going to bother me. I'm going to be on the beach. I need a paperback, um, something not too large. I need something I can see with my sunglasses, so I need a large font. Um, so the books we're going to talk about today... Uh, what criteria? These are just your favorite books, or your at the some moment? of them are. Yeah, I'm um, like the first one is my absolute favorite book of the year so far. Is that Fleischman is in trouble? Is that Fleischman the one? is in trouble by uh, Taffy? How do you say this? Brodesser Ackner. Ackner. Uh, uh, we're going to go through these books, I think, in no particular order. So we'll start sure. with Fleischman because it's your favorite. It this, is my favorite. This is the debut novel from New York Times Magazine staff writer Taffy Brodesser uh, Ackner. Uh, it's about a a Manhattan. Is it hepatologist? Yes. Is that a blood doctor? No, that's a liver doctor. A liver doctor. Uh, Pretty specific. (laughs) It is. It is. And out of the ordinary, but it's about his adventures in date land. He's dating now because his wife has kind of dumped the kids on him and left. Uh, And he has been increasing... The a- increasing the ages of the women he's swiping left and right on. Correct. On once, his dating he, app. once he finds a sweet spot, he's incredibly happy. Is that an oversimplification of the plot? Um, it is an <laughs> oversimplification of the plot. You know, the poor man, um, him and his wife have, have agreed to divorce. She is an agent. Um, they live the nice lifestyle in New York City. They have two children, ages 11 and 9. Um, he fancies himself the better parent and is always reminding his soon to be ex wife of that. Um, He's a liver doctor, and she resents the fact that she makes more money than he does, evidently. Is that right? She makes a lot more money than he does. How can that be? She's a talent agent. He's a doctor. Well, it depends on who your talent is, isn't it? I mean, that's the whole... Never thought about that. So, but it is absolutely laugh out loud funny. Um, I was at with my husband Fraser at a restaurant, and I was reading him out loud passages. And the lady behind me, you know, taps me on the shoulder and says, "What are you reading? I have to read it next." Wow. And it's one of those books. The title's not great, 
The book cover's even worse. It looks upside down buildings in New York. They didn't know what to do with the book, but the readers have loved it. The reviewers have loved it. It is just laugh out loud funny. And I think she belongs up there in the, with the likes of Updike, honestly and truly. Well, that you're not the only person who said that. Uh, the, uh, one of the reviewers that I read said this belongs alongside the work of Saul Bellow, Philip, uh, Philip Roth, and, and John Updike. Absolutely. That, wow. She is that good. She is looking at the dissolution of a marriage through a feminist sensibility. And at first you're like, poor Toby, oh. <laughs> and then you realize uh, his wife, Rachel, maybe has disappeared for a reason. And so you have a little bit of surprise in the book. You uh. know, his wife dumps off the kids one morning, says, you take them to camp. And then she's not heard from again. And at first it's like annoying, and then it's like a little scary. Where did she go? This is the wife of my children. Am I gonna have to do this all the time? Can I get back to my Tinder swiping? I mean, uh, because he's very involved with and his newfound. And the story is not being told by him. It's being told by what a, a friend, an old friend named Elizabeth Libby Slater, who is a magazine journalist whose career has stalled. Is this the writer talking about herself? You might. You might infer that. <laughs> she writes for the what? The New York Times Magazine? She does. So I would say her career really hasn't stalled, but you know. I think it's just beginning. Okay. Wow. So she, the, the wife leaves and there is blame to go around as we come to find out as this book goes on. So is this a, a it's funny, but is it a look at, at marriage? Is that what it is? It is a look at marriage. It's a look at, um, res, you know, responsibilities in the marriage. When you have children, who's responsible for what? Um, is money enough to make everything better? Does it make it things worse? Um, it just, she really nails what's going on today with, with relationships as they dissolve. And why is it funny? Um, because it's true. Uh, I think that's what makes it funny. Um, all those little things that, you know, uh, they, it is funny because they're true. And um, well, we'll put these lists, the, the, this book of lists we're talking about on our website, but that book is called Fleischman is in Trouble by Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Uh, someone who will love, the, you know, I used to think that nonfiction books had long titles, but fiction books are beginning to be longer. <laughs> someone who will love you in all your damaged glory, stories by Raphael Bob Waxberg. Yes, I picked everybody that had the hyphenated names <laughs> this morning. Uh, uh, why is it hyphenated? I'm just curious. But do you I know why? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I just begin to think it's, you know, de rigueur. Uh, you know, you're supposed to have a hyphenated name. Uh, well, because I know in nonfiction you have to have a, 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 I have to have a colon in the middle of your title. Absolutely. Must have a And it has subtitle. to be three sentences yeah. long. That's right. So these are short stories. They are. Which seem perfect for summertime reading. They are perfect. Some of them are two pages. Some of them are eight pages. There's 18 of them. Um, I look at him like uh, the Sedaris's and a little bit of Amy and a little bit of David. Um, he's really very clever, very funny. Um, you can pick it up. Read one, put it down, and come back to it in two weeks. People may recognize this guy's name, the author's name, Raphael Bob Waxberg, because he is the creator of Netflix BoJack Horseman, a show that I have never seen, but I'm told it's blisteringly funny. I have never seen it either. And, and, and a little, and a little <laughs> off kilter. Is the book the same, off kilter? Absolutely. If you consider yourself a little zany, a little crazy, a little out of the ordinary, you're just going to absolutely love this book. Um, when my sales rep told me that she thought it was like David Sedaris, I, I grabbed it up. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't watch a lot of movies, but um, he, he's a great writer. You're in the wrong room. I guess I am. <laughs> So uh, th th these stories are all over the place. What, what does he write about in these stories? He writes about relationships mainly. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess we're in a relationship theme. And they're just so funny. Um, you know, there's one story, lunch with the person that dumped you. Um, rules for taboo is just a shockingly funny, weird a short story that, you know, with the game taboo, you're not, you're supposed to guess the word without using other words. And he just nails it. I mean, he's just wow. so incredibly clever. So who should read this? 
Um, anybody that considers yourself a little off kilter, a little off beat, um, if you have a zany sense of humor, if you're getting ready to see David Sedaris when he comes this fall here in Charlotte, um, you're going to love these. If you love a show, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't like it. If you don't want to commit to a novel or, or a piece of nonfiction, you have 18 chances to enjoy yourself. Someone who will love you in all your damaged glory. Stories by Raphael Bob Waxberg. Uh, here's this, this one I had to really, I had, I had to get on the internet and research Did this you one. Google? I had to Google this because at first I thought, is this fiction? Is it nonfiction? What is this about? This is called Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Michelle Richardson. It's set in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. It's the story of one Kentucky, one of Kentucky's last living blue people. And I thought, is this a novel? Is this real? It's real. It's historical fiction. There were blue, are there blue people? There are blue people. Everybody Because there are now, photographs of them, and they're blue. Google Troublesome Creek, Kentucky, or Blue People, Kentucky, and you will see Papa Smurf. That was his nickname. He had blue skin. Uh, blue nail beds, blue sclera of the eyes. They are a beautiful light blue. This is a genetic condition that people in that part, why? Is it just in that part of the country? It world? is just in that part of the country in Kentucky. And what happened was um, there was immigration from France, where some people from France had this genetic trait. They moved to Kentucky. And since Kentucky has a lot of mountains, hollers, People did not uh, mingle much, did not get around much, so there was a lot of inbreeding. So that's why it's the last place. So is this where the term blue blood came from? Seriously. <laughs> I'm, I'm, seriously. You know, I they're didn't blue. think about that. I mean, they're that. indigo blue, these people. They're beautiful. I think yeah. they're absolutely gorgeous. It's a little odd with some of the hair colors, but, but that's just because that's what we're used to. I mean, these, these people could be in, what was that movie that they did with the avatars that uh, James Camp? Avatar. Camp Avatar. <laughs> 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 so, uh, what's this book about? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's blue people. That's what it's about. It is about the um, Pack Horse Library Project, which was part of the New Deal. And what happened was Roosevelt paid women to go throughout the rural um, parts of, of Kentucky to bring books to people. It's a bookmobile. It's a bookmobile uh -huh. via pack, pack mule, pack horse. Okay. So, um, so the main character, Cussie, um, that's her nickname, and she is pale blue skin because of, of her parents, obviously. And it turns out that is a genetic disorder um, dealing with the iron in the blood. Okay. And so she, it's basically a book of these people in this time, but it's also a book of discrimination. If you are different than you are other, people treat you differently. Um, her father wants more, nothing more than for her to be married. Um, she really loves books. Her mother loved books. She wants to honor her mother. But she kowtows to her father and marries um, a man who is older than she is. And he dies on the wedding night, and um, his family blames her because she's other. She looks differently. That, you know, she cursed him. She she bewitched him. She she's at the the fault of this. I'm sure when he died, she was very blue about it. Oh, oh. 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 Uh, so I, I should have seen that one coming. <laughs> yeah, <she's>, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but she's also faced with a decision, isn't she? Doesn't she meet a doctor along the way who? potentially could cure this. He potentially can, and he helps her out with her everyday life, and so she decides to uh, basically endure his tests so he can find out what causes the condition. Okay. And it is a lot of torture. I mean, if, you know, it's the 1930s, medicine is not at, at its apex, um, but, you know, she does not have a lot of friends. She has more foes than friends at this point in time. So it is historical fiction. It is historical and, fiction. And you can trace these people. There are people on the Internet with names. Who Absolutely. They trace this back to. I think probably 90% of your audience right now is Googling it. Uh, that's exactly right. Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Michelle Richardson. When we come back, we'll talk about some other summer reading on your plate. And then we'll talk about summer movies. So don't go too far away. A laundry list of things to talk about here today on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Sedoma Law, a family law practice serving North and South Carolina, dedicated to helping individuals and families find solutions to the many aspects of divorce. 704-442-0000, Sedoma Law. Dot com. Tomorrow on this program, it's Friday. That means the local news roundup, a long stalemate over the state budget. Disagreement hinges on the expansion of Medicaid, major soccer news. 
We're going to be hosting a series of international matches over the next five years, and that may make Major League Soccer take a closer look at the Queen City. An attempted robbery at a fast food restaurant causes our homicide toll to rise, but homicides are not the only crime on the rise. Just some of the stories we'll be talking about with our roundtable of reporters right here tomorrow at 9. Millions of Americans pay a high price for being poor. The CEO of PayPal is working to change that. Managing and moving money it should be a right for all citizens, not a privilege for the affluent. Can financial technology, or fintech, level the playing field? PayPal CEO Dan Schulman, next time on 1A. That conversation coming up at 10 following Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins here on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Later in the program, we talk about summer films. Right now, we're talking about summer books with Sally Brewster, the owner of Park Road Books. And next up is Never Have I Ever, a novel by, is it Jocelyn? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Why is there an H in it? Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask her mother and father. <laughs> so Jocelyn Jackson, another novel involving a Southern family. Uh, and the title makes it sound Southern. It's billed as a nail-biting suspense drama, though. Is it, it is. It is. Uh, Jocelyn has always written about family dramas, the South, and this she has interjected some great, thrilling, page-turning stuff. It all starts off with a book club. Um, this woman had had a tumultuous past in her in her teen years. She has gotten quite tame, married, kids, suburbia. Book club. Book club, yes. Book club. So there's danger in the book club. There's very big danger in the book club. And this is more so than just the wine. They move to gin this time. Um, honestly, the bottle of gin comes out, and a new person arrives, and they start tossing out the book and start talking about, well, the game Never Have I Ever. And this new person seems to know something about the hostess of the book club. And it starts getting weirder and weirder. And we realize that this new person in town has something out for the hostess of the huh. book club. And evidently, I've read that, that, that uh, just when you think as the reader you've got this figured out, the ground shifts every oh, time. absolutely. It sends you off in a different direction. You think, oh, I, I know this. I've got it. And she is such a great writer that, no, you don't. Yeah, that takes skill. It's called Never Have I Ever. It's by uh, Jocelyn Jackson, although it looks like Jocelyn. Uh, <laughs> there is another. We, we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll skirt p through this very quickly, but there's another short story book called Growing Things and other stories by Paul Tremblay. Paul Tremblay. And one reviewer says these stories live in the increasingly popular space between literary fiction and horror. We're going to talk about horror a lot when we talk about movies in, in a second. Given the scary world in which we live today, <laughs> why, why are people attracted to horror? Uh, it makes you feel better. That's scarier <laughs> than what's going on in real life, maybe. Okay. Substitution Order by Martin Clark. It's a legal thriller, and I read yesterday one reviewer said that the people who like uh, John Grisham should not miss this one. Um, Judge Martin Clark is absolutely my favorite legal writer out there. He is amazing. We just got back from Stuart, Virginia, where um, we were selling books for his debut, and 600 people in a town of 1,400 people showed up to come um, get his book and to congratulate him. Substitution order is a legal term? He, it is. He's a judge. He's a, circuit, a retired, retired circuit court judge, so he knows the courtroom pretty well. What's the plot? The plot is a lawyer has disgraced himself through a incident with alcohol and drugs. Um, he has made restitution. Um, he's doing everything he can to get back in good graces with the legal profession and his wife. Um, it's hard going. He lives in a very small town in Virginia. You can see a lot of similarities mm -hmm. between the mm -hmm. town. And everything is going well until somebody comes into the sub shop, which um, I will let you you know, that has the substitution. Um, uh, and basically what they want him to do is they want him to participate. In, um, they're going to blackmail him because they want him to participate in insurance fraud. Uh, and he's like, no, I'm getting my life back together. But what they, they keep, it's a chess game. They're like, well, we're going to do this if you don't do that. And it is just absolutely amazing. 
Um, it, the book of Job um, probably comes to mind because he kept getting these things thrown at him, and it's up to him to outmaneuver them. So uh, although this is a legal thriller, uh, it explores the lives of people in the rural South as opposed to keeping you cooped up in a courtroom. It absolutely does. Most of this does not take place in a courtroom. It takes place outside of the courtroom, which is where a lot of law does take place. Just, just so people know, I mentioned John Gershom, and if you like legal thrillers, John Gershom seems to be the king of the hill in, in that department. But Entertainment Weekly calls Martin Clark our best legal thriller writer. Would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree with that. And if you would like to meet him, I'm going to do a plug. He's going to be at the store next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and we're going to be doing a podcast with Charlotte Reader's podcast, a little competition. He's in like. everyone. <laughs> you know there are 450,000 podcasts out there. Did you know that? I had no idea. There are. There's only one Charlotte Talks. And that's why it's been around for 20-plus years, right? Well, good, good for you on your podcast. <laughs> oh, it's not my podcast. It's, okay. it's Landis Waits, yes. Oh, okay. Thanks for the plug. Uh, Ghost, of, <laughs> Ghost of Eden Park, the bootleg king, the woman who pursued him, and the murder that shocked Jazz Age America by Karen Abbott. Now, this is, is this fiction, historical fiction, or is this real? This is real. Okay. This because is history. I remembered this story. I also Googled this one because not only did I remember the story, I remember the key, one of the key characters in it uh, because it's set up during Prohibition. Correct. And it involves... Uh, uh, this bootlegger who is monstrously wealthy and the woman out to get him. And it's said that HBO, people who liked HBO's broad, uh, Boardwalk Empire will enjoy this. Well, I think that the Mabel Walker Willebrandt character made a brief appearance or someone like her made a brief appearance in Boardwalk Empire. She's the prosecutor. That would make perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, and because that was set in, uh, in, in Prohibition as well. I, I didn't see it. So, so <laughs> you need to get out more. Or in more. You can stay in more. Uh, uh, George Remus is this filthy rich, teetotaling bootlegger. Uh, and, and his massive empire includes politicians, police, prohibition officers. What a surprise. Taking cash and liquor bribes. And Mabel Walker Willebrandt, who's with the Department of Justice. Yes, he has found a loophole in 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 the an act. He he, he does she, well. No, he no. does. Um, Remus discovers a loophole okay, Remus where he can, you know, alcohol is medicine. So he is selling medicine, the elixirs, he's the tonics, make you feel better. So he is bringing in, um, you know, he's he's carrying a hundred thousand dollars in his pockets at all time because he's making so much money. Him and his second wife, he would light, he would light cigars with hundred dollar bills. Yeah, hundred dollar bills. And this is when people were making like one thousand four hundred dollars a year. So just <laughs> the scale of it, and just the wanton abuse is just it's it's mind boggling when you read what they went up to. But then you get this great prosecutor who they think, oh, she's a woman, she's not going to do anything. We'll we'll set her after him, and she'll fail. And she doesn't. And it is just absolutely wonderful. Karen Abbott is just an amazing, we call it great narrative nonfiction. This story has been around for 80 years. Is mm -hmm. she the first person to write about it? I'm not sure of that. I know that she's the most exciting writer of this story. Really? Yeah. I mean, she just brings it to life. Okay. It's a long title. It's called Ghost of Eden Park. Let's just leave it at that. Cause, okay. Because there's a lot that follows that. Ghost sure. of Eden Park by uh, Karen Abbott. Furious Hours up next here from the Ghost of Eden Park, described as the Great Gatsby of nonfiction to the story of a series of rural Alabama murders that inspired Harper Lee to try to write again after uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, that's The Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Sepp. Right? Sepp, mm -hmm. uh, So again, this is based on truth. This is based on truth. Um, what happened was after uh, she went with Truman Capote to investigate in cold blood and his success with it. She went back to Alabama, and there was this murder trial going on of, of River, Reverend Willie Maxwell. If you happen to be part of Ms. Uh, Reverend Maxwell's family, you should be very careful because everybody kept dropping dead around him. And um, there was, interesting enough, there was insurance policies out in all these people. Yeah. And so Harper Lee starts going to the, the court cases and paying attention to this. And it's called Furious Hours for a reason, um, the writing. And what Ka Casey Sepp does is I think she writes the book that Harper Lee wanted to write. 
Because she couldn't. She tried to write again. She and tried. She could, and, and one of the things standing in her way is she wanted to. She wa was trying to learn from the lesson of Truman Capote because he evidently wrote outside the journalistic lines when he did In Cold Blood. Yeah, fiction, nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, she that, wanted to no. stay inside. Correct. Evidently couldn't pull it off. And she could not pull it off. And that's what made the furious hours, the furious hours of how am I going to form this? How am I get this to do it? And so it's two great stories in one. It's the fascinating true crime story of, of the Reverend Willie uh, Maxwell and Harper Lee trying very hard to wow. produce her next book. So it's called uh, Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Sepp, C-E-P. The Vagabond is up next. This is I, I don't know why I know this story, too, but I do. Uh, Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, they were friends. And in 1914, they took yearly automobile trips. I guess he could get any car he wanted to off the I line. guess so. Uh, but uh, evidently, uh, uh, um, uh, Henry Ford would supply the car, and he would pay for all, all the expenses. Uh, Edison was along for the ride, but, she, but he was also kind of the navigator, although another guy, Harvey Firestone of the Firestone Tire Company. You might know that name. Planned out the trips and went along, too. This is obviously nonfiction. How did Jeff Gwynn learn about these trips and the details? Because it, these are not, it's not just the fact that they took the trips. He details what they did on these He trips. details what they did, who they met, um, the reason why they went places. Um, it was very much glamping um, that we call it now. They would bring along cooks and chefs and, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of... It well, they kind of had to because they, they, you didn't have the uh, infrastructure that we have today for road trips. Sure, but you could have brought a potato and thrown it in the fire. This is but Henry they did Ford. not do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's a fascinating look. It's a fascinating look out of both of them. It starts off actually with the first story is uh, the first chapter is 1923. And they go to a family who is known for their folk music. And it is just absolutely interesting, incredible look of America at this point in time when automobiles were just beginning to open up America to everybody. Yeah, roads hadn't been built to many. Roads hadn't been built, yes. Paved roads. And, 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 and it talks about how arduous these trips were because they, they went to places like the Florida Everglades. I mean, <laughs> there's no place to sleep. Uh, I don't know how you do that. And it also said that Henry Ford, these other guys would, would rough it, and Henry Ford would stay in a hotel. <laughs> I doubt seriously there was a hotel in the Everglades. I that doubt that seriously, too. But it really is just... Um, it's such a great look at Americana and how, you know, the cars followed the trains, um, basically. That's where the roads became. And thanks to these wonderful, inventive men, and this is the story of invention of America. Yeah. You know, we are now, too, with the Internet and, and digital, but this was manufacturing. This is uh, radio, phonographs, uh, cars. I mean, just, it, it's absolutely wonderful. S so everybody should read this, or who should read this? Who's this um, it, anybody would be interested in it, but if you're an aficionado of history and the automobile, you're going to love this book. Okay, let's end with something that's particular to the summertime, uh, an, another nonfiction book. It's described as a groundbreaking book, and it's by a documentarian and a, conservation by the, a conservationist by the name of William McKeever. Emperor, Emperors of the Deep, Sharks, the most... I can't read the title. <laughs> Emperors of the Deep, Sharks, the Ocean's Most Mysterious, Most Misunderstood, and Most Important Guardians. What makes this book groundbreaking? Because if we lose sharks, we lose our ecosystem in the ocean. I mean, yes. And then if we lose our oceans, we are dead meat. Um, they are the apex predator. Um, they have survived, um, you know, five extin level, extinction level events. Um, one that killed off the dinosaurs, and they managed to survive. They're older than trees. They're older than trees. Who knew? And they only kill six people a year, whereas we kill 100 million sharks a year. So we're the bad, we're the shark. We are the we are the we're apex. The we are the apex predators. So uh, why do why are they? What, what role do they play in the ecosystem that makes them so vital? Um, they do cleanup. Um, basically, it's cleanup is, is a good word for it. Too much um, dying off, they take care of it. Um, their uh, sonar systems, for lack of a better word, I am, I am not a scientist, are amazing. They have electroreception. It's a sixth sense that lets them pick up on the electrical field of other animals around them. Including us? Including us. Everybody that, remembers Jaws. Does that explain the attraction that sometimes <laughs> makes headlines? I think so. I think wow. so. So they're dangerous, but they're, we have to have them around. We have to have them.
Wow. So is this... <laughs> Is this beach reading? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's beach reading at its best. <laughs> well, maybe for you. Uh, Emperors of the Deep, Sharks, the Ocean's Most Mysterious, Most Misunderstood, Most Important Guardians by William McKeever. Sally Brewster from Park Road Books, always interesting. Thanks for uh, – so, uh, I'll, I'll recommend some TV shows for you. Well, oh, thank you. I'd appreciate Stick it. Stick around. We, we can recommend some movies in case you want to just uh, – I will definitely do that. Work a little less. Sally Brewster from Park Road Books. Why it must be movie time. From summer reading is on to summer movies, even though Hollywood films are facing a lot of competition from streaming services and traditional TV, box offices are still hauling in money, particularly at this time of the year. So to find out not only which movies are doing well, but which movies are worth spending your money on, we turn to two movie critics. Matt Brunson is back formally with Creative Loafing Charlotte. Matt's now the critic for The Film Frenzy. Uh, it's film at thefilmfrenzy.com. It's a great website, by the way. Oh, thank you. And also for Connect Savannah in Savannah, Georgia. Do you have to go down there a lot? I got to leave in five minutes. So let's okay. Make <laughs> and Adam Frazier is back with us. He's a member of the Southeastern Film Critics Association. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So there have been only two movies that I have even thought of going to see <laughs> this summer. Am I alone? Is this a function of age? Is it the fact that th during this period, Hollywood focuses on movies that are aimed at 13 year old boys? Or is this because. The movie system has movie season has just been rotten this year. I think a little bit from all those <laughs> columns. Uh, I think a lot of though it is a season when they really do target you know kids being out of school and all that. So there is a lot more youth oriented films, and then there's just a handful of counter programming titles to you know for older viewers to offset the. Because there have been a lot as I was reading through this yesterday, there's been a lot of disappointment at the box office from these big film studios. Right? They put these movies out thinking they're going to haul in the money, and they didn't. Yeah, I think most of it is trying to tap into nostalgia for franchises that um, aren't as popular as maybe the studios. And think. isn't that the problem? I mean, every uh, not everything, but uh, the great majority of what we're going to talk about here are sequels and redos. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, just Pixar itself is an example. Their first 10 movies, only one was a sequel. Of their last 11 movies, seven have been sequels. So there's quite a shift, not just with them, but with all the studios just turn into the past for, for future Be Because what, work, what worked before will work again and, exactly. we'll, and we'll just make money. It, and that's what it that's is. That's the theory anyway. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the other part of this, of course, is that movies now are international. And they always have been, really, because American culture has been exported for years mm -hmm. in, through cinema. But really, they're making movies that appeal to foreign markets. And if they don't do well here, it doesn't really matter, does it? No, often it doesn't. Um, a lot of the movies that flop here um, just are huge overseas, and that's a lot of times why we get sequels to movies we didn't think we would because well, of how bad they aside did Aside from the fact that France liked Jerry Lewis when most of America didn't, <laughs> what is it about the other markets that they like different things that are, are bombing here, Eric? Um, I think uh, Adam, excuse me. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of times it's sort of that Golden Globes um, sort of angle of they like movie stars. So something like Dark Phoenix, uh, which was not a good movie at all, um, people will see internationally because it has Jennifer Lawrence and other uh, big names in it. Okay. So when we come back, we're going to talk about some of these movies that we've been disparaging. Some of them aren't so bad. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, 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 are pretty good. And I, I think we'll talk about, I'm, I'm going to start with the one of the two movies that I really wanted to see. Which of course, I haven't seen yet, but because like Sally Brewster, I don't get out much. So <laughs> we'll come back and talk about that with Matt Brunson and Adam Frazier on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Mazda of South Charlotte, dedicated to those who believe a car should stir one's emotions and deliver a heightened state of driving. More at MazdaofSouthCharlotte.com. Digital platforms like PayPal have caused banks to scale back or shift their focus to adjust to new ways people are interacting with their money. Now count Facebook among the companies getting in on the digital disruption of the banking industry, but its new digital currency, Libra is already running into criticism from Congress and others. In 20 minutes, 1A will talk with PayPal's Dan Shulman about corporate responsibility and the future.
future of e-commerce. You can hear it right here on WFAE. After our discussion of summer movies continues, you can use your Libra to buy a ticket. <laughs> We're coming right back. Multi-course breakfasts are usually reserved for your weekends, but on Morning Edition, we serve up a full meal every day. So you get substance. Without empathy, we would be just alone. And something to savor, too. Live now, love hard, and appreciate everything. Get your fill of stories from around the world. Start your day with Morning Edition from NPR News. Listen for WFAE's Morning Edition weekdays from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Matt Brunson is here, film critic for the Frenzy.com, and Adam Frazier, a film critic and member of the Southeastern Film Critics Association. So let's talk about some movies here. Let's talk about first the one of the two movies that I wanted to see that I have not seen yet. That's the that's Rocket Man, the Elton John uh, uh, film, the one that chronicles his rise to fame. This got a new director halfway through the project. So what did uh, Dexter Fletcher? Uh, he's the only one credited. What did, what did he bring to this film that the other guy could not? Well, it was uh, actually Bohemian Rhapsody, where Brian Singer had been the director, and then uh, because of all the scandals surrounding him, they brought in Dexter Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And based on the huge success of that, they were like, well, this, he's good at making musical biopics, you know. So they got him also to do Rocket Man, uh, which I, I personally think is a better movie than Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, Partly because the other one was PG-13 and this one is R, so there's a little more. What makes honest. it different? The sexuality. Yeah, I mean the other one was just very, you know, they glossed coded over. and yeah, glossed over a lot more. This one is, um, you know, I mean Elton John's one of the producers, so of course it's a little glossed over. But I thought it was just a little more, um, a little more raw and honest. Uh, uh, you were uh, critical of Rami Malek getting the Oscar for Best Actor for that Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. film, the story of Freddie Mercury from Queen. Uh, but you say that the guy who plays Elton John, Taron Edgerton, mm -hmm. is sensational. Why? He really is. Uh, well, a lot of it, too, and I know this doesn't always play into it, but like, uh, it, I'm more impressed when they do their own singing, which he does, which like Bradley Cooper did in The Star is Born. And Rami Malek had a lot of digital help, and you know, it usually right. wasn't his voice. And I thought Taron Edgerton had to tackle every every aspect of this uh, role, and I thought he was terrific. I appreciate it. Even though Rocket Man is more of almost like a musical fantasy movie, um, it seemed to be truer to his life story than Bohemian Rhapsody was. There were some weird, glaring, like, inconsistencies with, like, history yeah. in Bohemian Rhapsody. They just moved stuff around for dramatic effect, and I don't think it worked. I, I read something about the costuming, because Wilton John, particularly early in his career, was known for these over-the-top costumes that he would wear, and that these are exaggerated versions, if that's even possible, <laughs> uh, of these costumes. Is that right? Yeah, everything in the movie is really sort of exaggerated and heightened. Like if you've seen the uh, musical Across the Universe, which uh, is about the Beatles, you know, it's, it's, it's in that vibe or something like an almost famous more so than a, a straightforward biopic. So let's move on to a, another highly anticipated film that turned out to be a turkey, <laughs> in many people's <laughs> opinions, Men in Black International. What went wrong? Here, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I did not see this movie. Okay. Uh, probably for the reasons that you're imagining. But um, I, I think really, um, look, everyone needs, all these other studios need to compete with Disney. And mm -hmm. Disney right now has all of their classic live action remakes, like The Lion King that's coming out next week. They have Star Wars and they have Marvel. So every single studio is just digging to find a, an existing property that they can exploit to somehow compete. And that's led to some really weird situations like Men in Black International. Have they ever considered being different? Never. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's absurd. <laughs> yeah, Sony, Sony actually is uh, so, uh, they're struggling for ideas so much that at one point they considered crossing over the 21 Jump Street series with Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum with Men in Black. So oh we're God. thankful that we got Men in Black International. <laughs> well, around. no, I wouldn't say well, that. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I saw it. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so you, you, you didn't like it? No, no. no it, it, so what about Spider-Man Far From Home? Tom Holland plays the Spider-Man. Uh, how many Spider-Man Spider actors does this now make? 
This is three. Three for the movies. Only three. For the movies, yeah. You say, Matt, that the first half of this movie is terrific. It's when the villain comes into focus in the second half that the film takes a tumble. Why? Yeah, I thought uh, I thought the one right before at Homecoming was much superior. In this one, I thought I, you can't give away too many spoilers, but the villain, once you you know find out who he is and figure all that out, I thought as a villain he wasn't that interesting, and uh, like his plot, his motives, and all that just seemed really on the weak side, especially following something as mm. huge as uh, Avengers in game uh so the second half i thought just kind of deteriorated i noticed on the website the film frenzy.com for which you uh, write um and and that's my site yeah your site that you that you have, have reverted back to the, the star ratings on these movies so uh, how many stars did you give spider-man uh two and a half out of four is that good it's it's a it's yeah, it's above plus, average it's C like plus? Uh, yeah b minus around there <laughs> i would recommend people see it just with reservations Okay, so just so we get all the monster movies out of the way, early on in this conversation, Godzilla is back in Godzilla, King of the Monsters. I only have one question. Why? <laughs> well, and again, um, it's interesting. Uh, so this, this movie is uh, Warner Brothers. and uh, They're not doing so well this year. No. Okay. Um, Warner Brothers is like the opposite of Disney. They seem to fail at everything that they try to compete <laughs> with Disney with. You know, like if you think about... Marvel, like Mar Avengers Endgame, is the 22nd movie of this epic, you know, uh, long-form storytelling adventure. Warner Brothers couldn't even really get Justice League off the ground. Um, Marvel or uh, Disney is is doing great things with Star Wars right now. Uh, Warner Brothers went back to the well too many times with Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, and uh, with diminishing results there. So Warner Brothers uh, secured the rights for Godzilla, King Kong, and they've been putting together their own monster verse, uh, which is really nothing new. If you go back to the 60s and 70s, you know, all those movies were monster mashups anyway. And even before that, the Universal uh, Monsters, you had Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and stuff like right. that. So it's not really anything new. It's just taking advantage of the new special effects uh, to reintroduce audiences to these characters. So there was a remake uh, of Godzilla in 2014, and mm -hmm. you, Matt, described it as the Manchurian Candidate of your movie-going experience. You write, I know I saw it. I have the review right here in front of me, but damn if I can recall any of the particulars. Wow, that good, was it? Well, so how's this one? How's the 2019 version? It's the same thing. I can't remember the one. <laughs> you like know, about this series. It just doesn't like, stick in my memory. Like, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. It's Godzilla, King of the Monsters, not Godzilla, King of the Drama. You know, like, you're not going to see this movie for, you know, complex relationships between human characters. That's just not there. So um, the new one, uh, the main characters are Mothra, Rodan, Godzilla, King Ghidorah. There's some humans in You've it. You've lost me. There's some <laughs> actors in it. But, you know, it doesn't matter what they I'm do. Going back just... to, I'm going back to Sally Brewster. Sally, <laughs> read any good books lately? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Let's, let's move on to another pop music uh, movie, Yesterday. The conceit here sounds really interesting, mm -hmm. that there's a, some kind of an event in the world and everybody gets amnesia about Beatles songs. They've never heard any of them, and this one guy remembers them and sings them and becomes a big star as the result of it. That's, 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 the, that's it in a nutshell, right? Yes, yes. Does it work? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, it's a great premise, and you're like, well, can they pull it off? And I would say this and Book Smart are my two favorite movies so far this summer. Um, I thought this one was really charming, but not only that, I thought it really... It kind of dug into what made the Beatles so popular, and also it has some segues that I thought were kind of daring. Um, you know, a lot of people may not like them, but I thought I thought it worked well within the context of the movie. And I don't want to give it away because it'd be spoilers. But and, and unlike most movies this summer, there's originality in this. Yeah, and that's that was just shocking. I shocking. almost fainted in my seat. <laughs> <laughs> Who, what studio is responsible for this one? You know, uh, off the top of your was head. it Universe? Okay. I think Universal. Universal. They're smaller. So let's talk about some of these sequels. Not that we haven't already been talking about them, but Toy Story, Toy Story Four. Pixar is responsible for Toy Story, and they were bought by Disney. Is their light going out under the Disney umbrella? Because you didn't like these, this movie, did you? No, I liked it okay. I just don't think it's a masterpiece like the first three. It's just it's a fun movie, but uh, but like I said, seven of their last eleven have been sequels, so. That's, that's Adam? The... I think it it's like visually stunning. It might be the best looking movie that Pixar has <laughs> made. But it's it's weird. It's like you think these movies are for kids, but uh, Toy Story came out in '95, and right. Toy Story Four really feels like it's for the people that grew up with Toy Story. It, 
it's like filled with existential dread. You know, sometimes you just want to go to a movie and enjoy it and escape, you know, <laughs> the hellscape that is 2019. But then you go to this movie and there's a, a character named Forky who's like an assemblage of popsicle sticks and glitter and stuff. And he's literally suicidal. And he's trying to throw himself in the trash at every given turn because he feels disposable. And it's just like, man, who is this movie for? You know, it's, it's not really, <laughs> it's, it feels less like a popcorn movie and more like the kind of like instructional educational film you'd show a child to like help them cope with it, abandonment. Don't it's put, like, don't put those popsicle sticks in the trash. Put, <laughs> put them in the recycling. Please, we're begging you. All right. Speaking of recycling, do we need another Life of Pets 2? Secret Life of Pets 2, Rabbit Redux. <laughs> we, we didn't need a one, so... I, I'm... We're, we're, batting, we're batting zero here, aren't we? <laughs> Emma Thompson, who is in a wonderful new TV show right now called Years and Years, she's starring this summer as the first female late-night talk show host, Catherine Newbery, in the film Late Night. She's suddenly become vulnerable as this talk show host for several reasons, and her she hires, as a result... Her first female writer, played by Mindy Kaling. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed this one. Uh, Mindy Kaling also wrote the script, and uh, it, it's one of those, a premise you're kind of like, well, is this going to work? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing we've never had a late-night female talk show host, so it's kind of weird. That oh, yes, we have. This, oh. Joan Rivers. For like a oh, week. Yeah, I guess, yeah. For about a week. Yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the movie itself, yeah, I thought it was very smart and very engaging. I quite enjoyed this one. Okay. Uh, Disney's Dumbo, speaking of remakes, it got a remake early this summer. Oh, no. A combination of animation and live action directed by Tim Burton, of all people. And now The Lion King is about to open, as you've already referenced, uh, John Favreau's uh, live action CGI remake. People love The Lion King. Disney's raking in bucks on this story on Broadway as it continues to run there. How... Highly anticipated is The Lion King. I would say at this point it's the most anticipated and, movie of the summer. And what lessons has Disney hopefully learned from Dumbo? Well, it's, it's and, interesting. Well, and was it too late to learn those lessons at that <laughs> well, point? Well, Aladdin made a fortune, so... Yeah, yeah like, the <laughs> consistent. it's interesting to see the consistency on that side of things versus Star Wars and Marvel in terms of how they're treating their classics. Um, I think it was 2015 they did the live-action remake of Cinderella. That was really good with mm -hmm. Kenneth Branagh. And then John Favreau did the Jungle Book uh, uh, update, which was fantastic, and that's really what spurred all of this. As soon as I saw Jungle Book and the way they were able to do those effects with the animals, you knew Lion King was, was coming. So um, Dumbo was a, a huge miss uh, for me. Why? Uh, mm. uh, super depressing. And again, Dumbo is the story with all these great talking animals, and, mm -hmm. and they, they literally take all that away from the movie. And what you're left with is a really cute CGI elephant and a one-armed Colin Farrell, and it's just really depressing. Um, and then... Uh, Aladdin, I did not care for at all. I just thought it, it lacked all the magic uh, of the original. But it has Will Smith. <laughs> it does have Will Smith, and that's all I remember about it, because he just overpowers every single scene with just Will Smith. Is that his fault or the director's fault? Um, the way it was cut? Uh, you know, director, the director Guy Ritchie, like on paper, if you tell me he's making an Aladdin movie, that seems really appealing because he does a lot of like uh, crime caper uh, movies. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just doesn't work uh, when you try to – he's just dealing with so many tones. He's trying to capture the spirit of the cartoon. He's also trying to make it a little edgier and grimier. Um, I think the decision to cast Will Smith as really the only star and surround him with up-and-coming people um, – is an interesting one because okay. it's it's pulling away from the drama of those characters. I, I, I want to uh, bring up the fact that w one of our producers, Chris Miller, who is a thirty-something with with the mind of a ninety-something guy, uh, uh, wanted to correct me and say that the, the first talk show, female talk show host, late night talk show host, was Dagmar on Broadway Open House. This has got to be the nineteen forties <laughs> or the nineteen fifties. <laughs> I, I don't know where he comes up with this stuff. Okay, uh, Shaft is back this summer. This time around with Sam. Samuel L. Jackson playing the nephew of that private detective John Shaft, created by Richard Roundtree. This is the third Shaft movie. Are we getting it? 
uh, the third. shaft that is. <laughs> well, it's actually the fifth it's shaft. It's the movie. fifth shaft. Yeah. Movie. It's even worse. All right. <laughs> so and actually, he's his son, and then in this one, his son comes along and joins them. So it's three generations. It's not his of, shaft. It's not his third. nephew. It was in the two thousand movie, and in this one, they wanted to continue the lineage. So there's a line about, "Oh yeah, you used to pretend you were my uncle, and you're really my dad," which was kind of silly. It's but... getting worse and worse <laughs> as you talk. <laughs> oh, oh, it, is it any good? Um, it's Can't got its go moments. Check. It's got its moments. Just for Samuel. L. Jackson. Did they bring back the song? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You always have to bring back the song, but not enough, I must say. Not enough. Whatever happened to uh, James Bond movies? Whatever oh, happened to them? We're still getting another one. There's another one Are coming. We? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was another X Men movie this summer, Dark Phoenix, and you called it often excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the X Men series has been probably my favorite, and this movie was <laughs> such a crushing disappointment. I think it's 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 pretty much done at this point. Okay. I think. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, Marvel, uh, the the acquisition, Disney's acquisition of Fox, the rights to X-Men are going back to where they began with Marvel anyway. So this was sort of the last hurrah for them. And uh, Everybody's so tired in it. They're done. Yeah. There, there, another sequel, Annabelle Comes Home. It's a third film in a series, which in itself was an offshoot of another series of films. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, it, was it worth seeing? Very no. Quickly. Okay. The, it was oh. a horror film. Child's Play is a horror film. The Dead no. Don't... No. <laughs> no. The Dead Don't... It's not a horror film? No, say no, don't see it. (laughs) The Dead Don't Die is a zombie and therefore a horror film. Yes or no? No. Okay. Uh, And Crawl is a horror film. We're seeing it this week, maybe. Midsummer is another horror film. Yes. Yes, see Yes, it? definitely see that. The Nightingale, which comes out in August, is a follow-up to the global horror phenomenon of the Babadook. I-, I thought horror films came out around Halloween. What's the fascination with horror films in the summertime? I think uh, it's a little uh, alternate programming. Like mm-hmm. if you're if you're tired of superhero movies and kids movies, it's out there. So we have one minute left. We have to get to Quentin Tarantino. His upcoming film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's star-studded: Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, Al Pacino, Damian Lewis, Bruce Dern, Luke Perry, Dakota Fanning, Timothy Oliphant, among others. Have you seen it yet? No. What's the word on it? Do we know? Uh, mostly, mostly positive. It's good. Mostly, I did not know Luke Perry was in it though. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah, <laughs> exciting, isn't it? Luke Perry. <laughs> I don't want to go that far. Luke Perry is back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> I believe it might have been his last movie. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, how would you rank this summer in comparison to the last several? <sighs> Meh. Yeah, it, it's uh, the last several have been kind of weak. There have been a few really good movies, but a lot of just stuff. Should we look forward to, to the wintertime Oscar preview movies? Or, or, or is it, are these just movies are dead now? What's the, what's the deal? <laughs> uh, I, no time to answer that. Think on it on your own. Come up with your own opinion. Adam Frazier and Matt Brunson, thank you for joining us.